Well, welcome everybody to the Berkman Center luncheon. Uh, my name is Kareem Lakani. I'm a, uh, an associate of the Berkman Center, faculty associate of the Berkman Center, as well as um, uh, a professor over at the Harvard Business School. Um, and uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Jim Besson uh, for his uh, talk on his new book. Um, I've known uh, Jim for over 12 years. Uh, we met uh, when I was a PhD student at MIT. Um, and Jim, uh, you know, uh, uh, immediately struck me as being very different than the typical academic you would meet. Uh, you know, he actually has a lot of uh, experience with technology. Um, his, uh, he's an entrepreneur himself in the world of technology. And um, his first company actually uh, helped establish the desktop publishing paradigm, um, as well as uh, the first uh, sort of commercial WYSIWYGs. Um, and so in many ways, uh, we are um, indebted to him for helping to sort of uh, get one of the first sort of uh, office worker productivity revolutions going way back when, in the 80s. Um, and Jim, uh, that experience was, was foundational for Jim to both understand uh, technology, understand innovation, uh, and understand the challenges of um, the, the pathway from invention uh, to innovation. Um, and in many ways, this book uh, uh, is his take, and it's a very novel and an important take on trying to understand sort of the, the ongoing waves of technological revolutions that we observe in the economy uh, and the worrisome effects we, we think about in terms of uh, jobs and inequality and, and, and growth. And so um, I found the book to be fascinating. Uh, it's a great read, both in terms of conceptually the arguments that Jim is making, um, as well as the empirical evidence he, he lays to bear. Um, and he's really, I think, uh, from an academic, uh, thoughtful perspective, he's really pushing uh, both uh, uh, policy developers and policy makers and policy implementers to think hard about historical evidence about innovation uh, and jobs and wages, as well as uh, the current dilemmas that we face uh, in terms of what we think are, is happening in the economy and potential uh, solutions to the problems we think are, are going on. So with that, I'm gonna give it to Jim. He's got about a 20 to 25 minute presentation on the, on the book. Um, and then I'll ask a few questions and then we'll open up to the audience for more questions. Okay, Jim. Thanks, Kareem. So the book is called Learning by Doing. Um, we tend to think about technology, a lot of people confuse, I think, technology and inventions. Uh, in the bigger picture, technology involves a lot of knowledge and skills, much of it held by large numbers of people, uh, not just inventors. Um, and developing that new knowledge when we have a major new wave of technology is a big social problem, a big social challenge. And, and that's, that's the focus. Today, um, we have new technology everywhere. Technology has changed the way we work, the way we shop, the way we entertain ourselves, the way we communicate with each other or not. Technology is everywhere except in most people's wallets. Uh, since the beginning of the personal computer revolution, the median stag wage has been stagnant in this country uh, after rising over a long period of time. So some people see this and think it's an evidence that we're really at a fundamental break from history, a fundamental break from the past. Um, but before we can say that we're really breaking with history, we have to understand what that history is. And, and history is important. Uh, over the last 200 years, technology has largely been responsible for over tenfold increase in the average wage. So if technology has led to stagnant wages more recently, it, is that a break? <clears throat> of course, technology is not the only thing, but technology has been the most important thing driving that, that huge increase. But in fact, in the past, we saw something similar. So these are the wages of weavers and spinners in the Lowell textile mills, uh, starting at the time of the Industrial Revolution. And they were stagnant, too, for uh, 30 or 40 years, and basic, until after the Civil War, when they started growing very rapidly. 
Uh, this was a time, though, even those first 30 or 40 years, when there was huge productivity gains in, in weaving. The reasons why things were stagnant then are certainly different now. The technology was different. The society was different. The challenges were different. But my thinking is that there's enough about what, was, what happened then that it's worth looking to understand what may be happening now. There's enough similarity in the challenges we face uh, so that it, it provides some insight. So an awful lot of people will argue these days that the reason we're seeing stagnant wages is that robots are stealing our jobs. But this, too, is nothing particularly new. Uh, this is uh, the weave room of a textile mill in Fall River uh, circa 1910. And you'll notice there's lots of machines, but very few workers, even then. Uh, the best mills at that time uh, had about 24 looms per weaver. So it was a huge amount of automation. Um, weaving was perhaps the... The power loom automated the, uh, the very tedious task of weaving, and it was one of the most important inventions of the technologies of the Industrial Revolution. Over the course of uh, uh, 100 years, effectively 98% of the tasks that a weaver performed were automated. Uh, this shows the amount of time uh, that a weaver needed to, to produce uh, a yard of cloth relative to the hand loom back in, in 1810, and it had dropped to only 2% of that time by a little after the turn of the 20th century. 98% automation, robots stealing jobs, machines taking over from workers, mass unemployment, right? No, the weaving jobs actually increased. Um, the blue line is showing the number of cotton textile workers. And it's the same if you just look at weavers. Um, what happened? The, the economy and, and technology were just more dynamic than we, we think in, in, uh, when we talk about robots or machines taking over. The, the automation reduced the price of cotton cloth. Lower price cloth meant much greater demand for that, for cloth. So people started consuming much more cloth. Uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, the, the, yeah, of the 19th century, um, producing cloth was a very, very time consuming process, very laborious. A lot of it was done at home. Um, and people wore very few items of clothing, and they used cloth for very few things other than clothing. By the 20th century, cotton and other textiles uh, were being used uh, for all sorts of things, and people had consumed much, much more clothing. So there's a very dynamic response. We, we see something similar today. We know that the ATM machine has taken over work of bank tellers, right? And people will tell you that you know, it's eliminated the jobs of bank tellers. Not so. Um, the top line shows the number of bank tellers employed. The bottom line shows the number of ATM machines installed in the US. A huge increase in ATM machines from 95 to 2005, and not much of a dent in the number of bank tellers. Why? It clearly took over work from bank tellers, but what happened was it made it cheaper to operate a bank branch. So there were many more, the, the banks installed many more branches. Uh, the job of the bank teller became less a job about handling cash and more a job about interacting with customers, being mark, helping market those customers, some of the higher margin products, mortgages, loans, whatever, that the bank sells. Uh, so the, the teller became part of a, more of a marketing specialist. Um, the dynamic response, uh, economic response, meant that uh, those jobs did not disappear, uh, and it meant that the skills of the teller changed. Of course, there are other cases you, we can look at where jobs did disappear. So in the 1970s, for, and f uh, for almost 100 years prior, most printed type was set on linotype machines like this. And in the 1980s, uh, we got computerized publishing, desktop publishing, and the number of typesetters and compositors dropped precipitously. But at the same time, a lot of that work was taken over by 
desktop publishers and graphic designers. And in fact, there were more graphic designers jobs added than uh, typesetter jobs lost. So you need to look at, at, at the entire picture uh, to, get a, to get a sense of jobs. And, and, and what you see is there are some areas like manufacturing where we have a net loss of jobs. And part of that is technology, part of that is globalization, offshoring. Um, and it, part of that has been happening for a lot longer than the 1980s. Uh, it's been happening, you know, the, the manufacturing share has been declining in some industries since the 20s or 30s, um, and certainly since 1950. Uh, those are mature technologies, so th they are being gradually replaced. But in the areas where computers, the occupations where computers are being used most heavily, the total level of employment growth was faster than average. Computers weren't a net replacing jobs, they were displacing people to new jobs. So I'm, I'm going to argue that the, 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 one of the key reasons technology is not helping wages these days is because of the challenges of developing new skills and knowledge. And again, it's helpful to look back uh, at the, the textile mills. Lowell, Massachusetts was the center of the textile revolution. It was sort of this, the Merrimack Valley was sort of the Silicon Valley of the day. Uh, here's Lowell 100 years ago. Um, the Lowell mills hired to, 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 uh, you know, to man the, the, the power looms, or to, to operate the power looms, I should say, they hired mill girls from all over New England, often farm, uh, teenage farm girls before they were married. Um, and they brought them into a unique environment uh, where there were all sorts of cultural and uh, educational opportunities. We're familiar with the way Google and some of the other Silicon Valley firms offer all sorts of amenities to attract highly talented, skilled people. There was something like that going on then. So this is Lucy Larcom, who entered the mills when she was a 12-year-old girl. Uh, she later became a college professor, and there's a dorm name for Wheelock College. While she was at the mills, uh, she studied German and botany. She heard lectures by John Quincy Adams and Ralph Waldo Emerson. She wrote poetry for the factory girls, one of the factory girls' magazines, uh, and her poetry caught the attention of Longfellow and John Greenleaf Whittier, who became her mentor, uh, and started her on a, a, essentially a, a career of writing and teaching. She herself compared the mills to uh, women's colleges uh, of several decades later. But the, the, the key thing is, the reason the mill owners did this was to attract very talented people who could uh, go into this strange environment, noisy, all sorts of weird machines doing things that were, you can imagine at that time, uh, highly futuristic. Um, and they had to acquire a whole new set of skills to use those machines effectively. So learning was key. We, we tend to think about the invention, but there's a, a huge amount of knowledge that goes into building, installing, operating, maintaining, organizing, marketing a, a major new technology like this. And it takes a long time for it to develop. It takes a long time for the institutions to develop that can train people, for the labor markets that can provide the, the right incentives for people. Um, and it takes a long time for the technology itself, to, as, as part of that process, to improve and develop. Uh, um, and it's difficult because a lot of that knowledge can't be learned in, a, in the classroom. It has to be learned through experience on the job. Um, we can, learning by doing. So we, we can see that with the, the, mill, the mill girls. Here is the, the, the productivity of a, of a weaver in, in, the, in one of the Lowell mills. Uh, based on the months that she was on the job, the, the, the number of yards she could of cloth she could produce in an hour, uh, and it rose dramatically over time. And, and it, in, in economic terms, that represents a significant investment. Um, it, we tend, some historians tend to, to think of factory workers as unskilled, and they, they were unskilled when they walked in the doors the first day, but they acquired skills on the job that were very significant, that were critical to the economic success of the technology, and that required a, a, a substantial investment. In fact, we can calculate the investment, and it turns out it's comparable. The investment in these mill girls was comparable to investments that uh, a, a craftsman might, might make in, in skills. 
So they had real skills. Skills was an important part of the equation. But what about wages? I already mentioned about how wages were stagnant for a long time. What went on then was that there really wasn't a labor market at the beginning. Uh, in the early years, 1830s, 1840s, uh, only about 18% of the weavers they hired had previous experience. In other words, they were training everybody. There was no labor market. You couldn't, you had, you had a difficult time if you wanted to recruit somebody. And a worker who was looking at these skills had to realize when she leaves her, this job, she, there's not an, another employer who's going to bid her away or another place she can uh, get work. She can't look forward to a career, so she's got less investment, less incentive to to uh, invest in developing skills. After the Civil War, a robust labor market developed, and there's some reasons why it took so long. Um, uh, and then wages started growing very rapidly. Then 87% of the weavers had previous experience, and there was a very active turnover. Uh, if I worked at one mill and I didn't like what I was getting paid, I could get a job at another mill, because somebody would pay me better. And so there was competition uh, for the skills of the weavers. Um, a number of reasons why it took so long, took decades to develop a, a, a labor market. And one was that the technology kept changing, and it wasn't standardized. People, different mills used, used different technology. They organized work differently. They provided different sorts of training. And also because of uh, a number of unique problems, there was little mobility, little ability for, for employees to go from one mill to another. I won't go into the... A lot of the details are very specific to the history. Um, but the net result was once a labor market developed and once the training institutions developed and once things were standardized, uh, wages shot up. And so by 1910, uh, the weavers were making three times as much as they were making in the 1830s. And so these mill girls, this is Amoskeeg in, in around 1910, they were showing off their Sunday best, not, not their work smart, smocks when they got photographed. What about wages today? You know, we can look at the linotype operators, the, te the typesetters, and the, the, the graphic designers, and interestingly, the median wage of the graphic designer last year was only a buck higher than the median wage of a typesetter in 1976. Very slow growth in wages. Yet, I think anybody who knows that industry would be hard pressed to tell you that the graphic designers don't have a much broader range of skills than the typesetter operators had. Um, what's going on? Well, we have similar problems with lack of standardization, lack of stability, lack of labor markets. So first we had the typesetter compositors, and they were replaced by print designers and desktop publishers. But then along came the web, and we now had to have web design skills. And along came the smartphone, and we had to have mobile design skills. And the graphic design started fragmenting into all sorts of specialties. You have information architects, user interaction specialists. Um, things are constantly changing. A few years ago, you had to know Flash. That's obsolete now. You need to know HTML5. Standards are constantly changing. Um, and it's difficult for the average designer. The schools can't keep up. What you, you can go to graphic design school and get a BA in graphic design, but what you learn is, is maybe out of date by the time you graduate. And labor markets don't necessarily recognize the new skills. I may have five years of experience, but the employer doesn't know, do I have the right experience? Do I have the experience on the latest tools? Uh, or do I have a less valuable experience? The top designers can teach themselves, and they can, are doing so continually and they can develop reputation. So what, what you have is sort of a divergence. The, the average designer has a harder time and their pay is stagnant. The top designers see rising pay and they're doing well. Um, and you see this problem more generally. So there's a gap between what the average worker makes in computer intensive occupations. The median wage is what the average worker makes. And if you look at the 90th percentile, uh, the wages for the 90th percentile are growing much, much faster. There's a growing gap, and we're seeing rising economic inequality even within occupations. In fact, much of the growth in inequality is within, about half of it is within occupations. And this represents to me a skills gap, that there's a gap between what the most talented people 
uh, the skills of the most talented people and the, and, the, and the skills that can be acquired by the average person. Uh, we can solve that gap potentially, but that's, that's the nature of the social challenge. So it's a story, in my view, of technology is not replacing workers with machines, it's displacing them. It's putting them into new jobs where they have to learn new skills. That's difficult uh, for many people, and so they may remain employed. Unemployment is not 30%, but they are facing a difficult challenge in earning good pay. Um, so the key thing is n new skills and knowledge and how do we develop it. And I want to, since this is Berkman, I'll talk a little about the role of knowledge sharing. There are a number of policies that we can, we can, we can think about, um, but we can talk about knowledge sharing in a number of different ways. Things like open source and direct sharing, open standards, uh, the role of job hopping and informal exchange of knowledge. All of these things are important in developing that broad base of, of new knowledge and skills. And some of those things are um, also very important in, in terms of techno technological areas like the internet. Um, they're important for two reasons. One, they help knowledge spread, and two, they help establish labor markets. And, and, and getting state labor markets with standardized skills is key to uh, getting higher pay for those skills. So there, there are some interesting parallels to the past, to the past and I'll, I'll just go very briefly since we want to be short and open up for discussion. So we have open source software, and, 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 and that is something that's very new and different. But I should emphasize this is a long history, a largely forgotten history, of inventor sharing uh, in all sorts of technologies. So William Gilmore was a British mechanic who came to the US and in 1817 developed the first power, the, 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 the design of a power loom that, that eventually became the industry, the, the most uh, popularly used design in the industry. He shared that design. Uh, he charged another mechanic $10 for the blueprints uh, and it was freely available to all mechanics. Um, you see similar sharing in a variety of other, particularly early stage technologies it wasn't open source per se, but a very similar ethos um, where mechanics would exchange designs with each other. They, uh, they were not happy necessarily if, if a downstream manufacturer uh, used their designs, but there was a, a great deal of communication and sharing among the community of mechanics. In fact, uh, one, one source talks about that they viewed themselves as the international fraternity of mechanicians. Um, open standards are a very important uh, part of what we deal with today. Um, uh, open standards for the internet uh, have been key in providing, uh, in, in ensuring its high degree of, of innovativeness. Um, I recall going to conferences in the early 90s where they were, firms were touting inter interactive TV. Uh, and at that time, the internet was seen as being sort of a poor and inconsequential cousin. Because of open standards, and, and, and I write about this in the book, the, the level of innovation and, and, and growth of skills and knowledge on the internet just far outstripped the interactive TV people. So despite tens of billion dollars being invested in interactive TV, it was pretty much dead within two years, and the internet took over. Um, that the sort of use of, of, of open standards was also critical in the past. Uh, we're all familiar with the typewriter, and the, we use the QWERTY keyboard today. When the typewriter first came out, there were different keyboards. This is, this is the ideal, a typewriter with a Hammond Ideal keyboard. Uh, it, but st standards and having open standards was critical towards developing uh, a labor market. So this is the number of stenographer typists uh, standardization, the, the first commercial typewriter was around 1870, was 1873. By around 1900, they had standardized on the QWERTY keyboard, and you can see the market took off. And, and there was a, a, a huge growth in the number of typists and stenographers, which changed the nature of the office, changed the role of women in the economy. Um, but the key thing was getting, getting to the standard. Uh, Another thing is the role of employee mobility. I, I noted about employee mobility earlier in, in, in the mills. 
Uh, a number of very interesting studies have attributed the relative success of Silicon Valley to Route 128 uh, in computing uh, to a different attitude about employee mobility and, in particular, different laws about the enforcement of employee non-compete agreements in California. Uh, by, uh, in, in California, employees are much freer to go to another company. They are much freer to start a spin-off. Um, and so there, research has shown that they are more likely to start a spin-off. They are more likely to start a new company. Uh, they are more likely to innovate in California or, or generally in states that do not enforce non-compete agreements. Um, the, the sort of networks of, of skills was also critical in the Industrial Revolution. The, the, the core of mechanics that started in Providence, Rhode Island, branched out across the Northeast, and there was active exchange of knowledge, active job hopping. People would go and work in each other's shops for periods of time to, to gain the broadest base of skills. So I, I've drawn some parallels. I think the, the, the key takeaway here is that broadly shared knowledge is key to broadly shared wealth. And so we want, to, we want to focus on discussion and we can think about different sort of policy questions that might affect knowledge sharing uh, and employee mobility. One is things like non-compete agreements and trade secrecy law, which can restrict the, the uh, uh, employee mobility. Other things are occupational licensing. One of the, the US ha workforce now has nearly 30% of the workers are subject to occupational licensing restriction compared to about 5% in 1950. There's been a huge increase and all sorts of, uh, in many cases, mid-skill or even low-skill occupations are subject to occupational licensing. Um, in, in many cases, that can impede uh, the uh, employee mobility or ab the ability to, to enter a new occupation. Uh, we can talk about software patents and their role in affecting startups. We can talk about things like uh, net neutrality is possibly restricting innovation. Um, so I, I, I wanted to throw a few things out, but I, put, to put it in, into context, uh, one of the troubling things about the last 10 or 20 years is that we're seeing declines in employee mobility. Uh, the workforce is substantially less mobile today than it was in 1990, and we're seeing declines in firm startups uh, um, to the point where there were in the last, after the Great Recession, there were actually more firm exits than there were startups. Um, things have improved since then a bit, but we're seeing a historically, you know, over the last, since 1980, a, you know, very significant drop in the role of startup firms in, uh, in being formed. And because we know about the role of startup firms in fostering new technologies, um, that's an important issue. So thanks, and now I'll turn it over, I guess, to Kareem to. So uh, the plan is I'll ask uh, the starting questions, but then we'll leave it up to all of you to continue the conversation. Um, and uh, I guess the, the first thing I would say is there's been a lot of books. There's a lot of hand-wringing right now. Uh, about AI uh, and how AI is going to, you know, not just take away sort of uh, sort of blue collar jobs, uh, like the Google car will come in and take away taxi drivers and so on, uh, but also law jobs too. So there's a big investment, like just as there's a big investment in marketing technology uh, and uh, financial technology, there's also now lots of investments in in, in law tech, right? A lot of startups are coming in and saying, we don't need lawyers for discovery, we can just get a smart machine to do it for us. So what's your sense in terms of the, 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 the real worry in the, amongst economists, amongst professions about sort of technology eating up white collar jobs? And what do you sort of see, like what would you tell this audience if they care about law and discovery and so forth? Like what's gonna happen to them? And, I mean, I, I, it was interesting in your book how you sort of showed there was almost 
two or three generations before wages went up. Right? So do we expect that to continue, or do we expect that to uh, shorten? Uh, do, and what kind of displacement might you see? So that's, that's more than one question. Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk about white collar jobs. So technology has been replacing white collar jobs for 30, 40 years, at least, right? Yeah. I mean, we've had accounting systems. We've had uh, yeah. desktop publishing. We, yeah. um, The, the number of jobs, so what, what, what tends to happen with, with and, 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 and here, here's the cr critical distinction, what, what, you know, what tends to happen is technology comes in and automates some subset of the tasks of performing a job. Yeah. Um, if that is value, if, if, the mature, if the technology is not too mature, that will tend to all, at the same time increase demand by lowering prices, by adding new value to the products yeah. um, or the services provided. Um, which in turn makes the remaining tasks, the non-automated tasks, more valuable. Uh, so there, there's, a, there's a constant trade-off. Some tasks are getting automated, but others are becoming more valuable, and there are new tasks being created to, to deal with the new machines and to deal with the new technology. Uh, so you see new occupations being created. Um, AI is only going to become, a, jobs is only going to become the real issue when technology is automating all of, 100% of the tasks. And I don't think we're, any, we're near that. Okay. Now, some people think we are. Right. Some people think there's gonna be a singularity in, sure, sure. around the corner and, and. If that happens, we're all screwed, but right. beyond that. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. So it, 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 some people will also argue that what artificial intelligence can do, I, I, I don't wanna get into this because I'm not sure I necessarily believe it or I, don't, I necessarily know. Yeah. Um, you know, that there, there are some inherently human things that we, we want for our service. You know, we want human interaction. Yeah. Uh, and unless the technology is really able to in, in, engage us emotionally, yeah. um, and maybe it will be able yeah. to, but uh, it, it can't deal with that. The, so I, I, I don't think the fundamental issue, you know, th there's always going to be jobs disappearing, yeah. um, whether they're white collar or blue collar. Um, and there's, there's also going to be new skills needed and new jobs appearing. So it, it's a turnover. And, and the real issue is how do we, you know, that's what's been happening. I mean, what, what I talked about is what's been happening so far. Yeah. Um, I don't see it changing radically in the near future. And the, the, the difficulty is, I, I don't mean to dismiss how difficult the transition is that people have to make. Yeah. Acquiring those new skills is difficult. Yeah. So that, that, that was the second, you know, why does it take so damn long and what's going to happen? So, you know, you can look at different occupations and you see different things happening. So, you know, desktop publishing, you know, it's not, I think it's very clear, we're not going to see that sort of, the wage picture there for the average worker uh, change until we have stable business models for, for publishing, which, you know, there's, there's still in huge flux right now until we see, you know, a greater stability in the technology. Not, not that the technology needs yeah. to, to, to stop dead in its tracks, but that it, 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 it occurs within a framework so that we can have, uh, you know, stable businesses, stable labor markets, and, and key sets of core skills that, that, are, that are understood and needed and, and, and people can, can acquire in school. And, and so the schools can catch up. You can look at other occupations. Healthcare is a, a sector where um, the, there's a whole lot of new technology, and there are also new business models. But we're seeing uh, the skills skills catch up, yeah. basically. So you you have a lot of mid-skill workers in healthcare. Their skills have become more valuable. Um, their em employment is going up. Uh, one of the key things that I write about is, uh, for, for some of the mid-skilled jobs, is um, new business models, like the ambulatory surgery center. So they have all of these outpatient clinics where you can get shoulder, they specialize in something, shoulder surgery or laser eye surgery. And in this environment, even someone like a licensed practical nurse who may only have 12 months of post-secondary training can come in learn valuable skills on the job, and within a few years, earn solid middle-class pay. The wages have been going up, 
jobs have been growing. Um, and in fact, there's been a huge shift in healthcare from uh, key care, the, the, the portion of care provided by the top level providers, by the doctors and dentists, and the portion of prepare care provided by the mid skill providers, anywhere from medical assistants and licensed nurse practitioners to uh, lic licensed practical nurses to nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. So this, I think, calculates something like 2 million new jobs committed, created in the, in the mid skill area. Yeah. So, it, I, I don't know which model is is going to proceed in dominating the yeah. economy over the yeah. next, you know, and how long things will take. But I, I think that's sort of the you, you can see both things happening, um, and it, you know, it's a question of, of of how long it's going to take the right thing to dominate. Yeah, and I think part of the worry is that you know uh, the. Uh, that the elites weren't affected before, right? So the the, the middle girls you saw weren't Harvard grads. Yeah. Right? In fact, they yeah. went there to get the education. But yeah. I think what's happening is that part of like why we see this as is that we could imagine that the market structure for law firms will change radically given this technology. And if law grads' initial work work was to go read volumes of documents and then be the sort of the heuristic classifier of, of, of knowledge is now and that can be done much more efficiently yeah. through AI, then that's gonna be the issue. And I think I think we see the same thing in marketing, we see, see the same thing in a yeah. range of occupations where the elites are now being you know, their jobs are being impacted and hence the worry. But anyway, so we won't have an answer for that yet, but let's open it up for questions and, and thoughts and, and comments. Oh, please introduce yourself so everybody knows who you are. And uh, uh, Brian Kane, MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy. Uh, Jim, could you say something about, uh, well, let me, let me put it this, start with the observation that weaving is more like manufacturing than it is like those other occupations. So why don't we see the same kind of uh, standardization and wage raising effect in manufacturing that you point out in weaving? Is it because it's a too heterogeneous category, that there's too much dispersion? And can you tie that into cluster effects? So going by your theory of standardization, promoting active markets, promoting higher wages, do you get Higher, uh, uh, higher tides raising boats in Silicon Valley than we got in Route 128, and is this an explanation of why certain industries like textile manufacturing uh, remained concentrated in one area? Uh, automobiles would be another example. Uh, how do you think about the geographic uh, and clustering dynamics? So two questions. Right. Yeah, okay. I, I thought yeah. they might tell you. So the okay. This well, weaving is manufacturing. I, I'm not, so I'm not sure what. Um, maybe I should uh, update the the weaving story because I en let it end in 1910. <laughs> um, so uh, w em employment grew and wages grew up through 1910 ni through the 1920s. Uh, with the Depression, uh, things leveled off. Um, I was focusing on cotton textiles, and you, you, so you, there's some complications that you had. New, new, but basically, you had a, a stable population uh, uh, employment of textile workers in, in, over different types of cloth uh, up until uh, 1970s, slow decline. I mean, you, the technology continued to improve uh, labor productivity about 3% a year. So you had a, you know, this constant, constant, constant uh, improvement in the technology, uh, saving the amount of, reducing the amount of labor needed to produce a yard of cloth. Um, and, and it continued, and it, um, what affected the textile industry in the US was more than technology though, uh, around 2000, uh, globalization, offshoring. Well, well, the industry moved to the south. It, it moved to the it, it moved to the south in the late night, starting in the late nineteenth century. Um, but even there, uh, it, it, you know, much of it was in the south. It was still, uh, um, you know, in nineteen seventy, uh, a weaver was earning a, a something close to the median wage. Um, it, it was a middle class occupation. 
Um, uh, well, what I'm thinking is that in the South, if, once it moves to the South, there's not going to be the same kind of uh, skills base there, right? Or is it so? I, I, so, so, so I. I I, I make a distinction, and I, and I think this is the crit a critical thing, and it relates to the geography as well, is the problems of developing skills are difficult for early stage technologies. You, things are, n are not standardized. It's hard to teach in school. They're changing rapidly. Um, once things become standardized, it becomes much easier to relocate. Uh, once something can be taught in a classroom, it be so you, you, you see this, for instance, uh, the periodic table, uh, I, I write about this in the book, the, per the periodic table and techniques of analytical chemistry in the 1860s, 1870s, standardized a, a large degree of chemical knowledge and made it much easier to, uh, to train chemists. Uh, training chemists had been something of, a, of an apprenticeship uh, prior to that. It became something that classroom training worked so that you see schools across the world starting to train chemists, and you see the practice of chemistry, which was originally clustered around small numbers of labs by lead scientists, run by lead scientists, growing all over the world. So you, you see, a, a, you know, and there's a, a constant pattern where um, new technologies are critically, often critically developed in geographical areas because the the, the, you know, the exchange of knowledge from person to person, from job hopping to other means of informal exchange is critical in an early stage technology because so much of the knowledge is informal or tacit. Um, once things become more standardized, you know, semiconductor technology can, can migrate from Silicon Valley to Taiwan. It becomes much easier. To, it's still difficult to set up a plant in Taiwan. And, and, and they went through hell, uh, you know, on, 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 on the first setting up the first plants and getting them running efficiently. But it was a less difficult problem than the original problem of, of developing the technology. Uh, so that, that's, that's the inter, interplay between ge geography and sort of the, the maturation of technology. So the, 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 as a technology matures, a number of things happen. It, it becomes more standardized, but also the, the demand effects become less. So in the early years, there was all this pent up demand. If I could lower the price of cloth, I could greatly in, improve the consumption of cloth. Today, you know, if you, if you lower the price of cotton cloth 5%, you're not going to be generating all that much uh, additional consumption. And, and you're not going to be as, you know, there's going to be a net loss uh, of jobs if you, if you have a 5% savings in labor costs. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Francisca Schwartzman. I'm a researcher at the Fletcher School um, at Tufts University. And um, I was wondering, so the way you described the displacement of workers, there is a lack for a certain period of time where the workers have to shift and learn new things. And within this time, you have to enable the workers to still you know, pay their rent and keep up their standard of living. So who do you see? should be responsible for that shift in the workforce? Do you think governments should be taking care of that? Or do you think that there is a massive shift in corporate social responsibility and big companies take care of that? And how would you incentivize the companies to actually um, do this and take care of that shift? Well, every, everybody's responsible. That's the easy answer. <laughs> um, so. Companies have uh, a difficulty at the same time in terms of they're, they're not able to hire the, the people with the skills they want. Uh, there are these, every year there are these surveys of uh, ma corporate managers and 35, 40% regular report they have difficulty hiring people with the, with the right skills. So what do they do about it? So some companies uh, are investing in training programs, working with local community colleges setting up work study programs so that people can learn some skills in the classroom and some skills on the, on the job. There, some trade, some industries are setting up certification programs so that skills learned uh, on the job through experience can be certified so that 
they become standardized in a way uh, so that other companies can can hire them. But that's you know providing that sort of retraining, uh, vocational training, perhaps an apprenticeship program. Companies are, are in the U.S. are experimenting with uh, with apprenticeship programs. Um, all of that becomes an, one part of the of the puzzle. Um, in terms of government support or social support, so there's some interesting research now coming out, both in the past and, and the present. But it, it, so it turns out, um, uh, Avner Greif is a very interesting economic historian at, at Stanford. And so he's, he's done studies about uh, the level of social welfare support and what that had to do with innovation in, in the Industrial Revolution. And, in England and in, and in Europe. And so it, it turns out that um, the counties or areas that had uh, a social safety net, a significant social safety net, uh, were actually more innovative. Uh, they were able to adopt and, 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 and adopt new technologies more rapidly. And he attributes this to basically you had less of a fear of revolution or rebellion, um, people were, you know, by, by providing the support, people were able to focus on uh, working with the new technology, were less resistant to it. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know the whole answer, but I, you know. I... Yes. I thank you for the fantastic talk. I'm uh, Shuang. I'm an anthropologist at Harvard. I'm uh, recently doing a research of Uber in China. So it's really interesting to me. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk more about the uh, increasing economic inequality you pointed out in your presentation. Uh, I very much agree with you that it's not really about replacing labor, but more about displacing. Um, for instance, in the Uber case, it's not about nobody is driving car, uh, taxis right now, but how um, Uber drivers are of a very different demography of traditional taxi drivers. The, over 50% of them are college graduates. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, this is one question. And also the follow-up question is how do you think the, um, per, you know, um, the, the suggestions you made in the end is really going to change this um, increasing uh, economic inequality, because as we can see, the knowledge is almost the, the most stagnant social hierarchy in our society. So are, are our education system going to change that, or is the um, technology innovation going to intensify this uh, uh, economic inequality even more? Um, so I'm not sure I fully got your question, but let me ramble around and see if I stumble on it. Um, so, if I could, so I think on the second question, I mean, the question is, in terms of knowledge needed to succeed, I mean, I think the, in the book, what, what was fascinating was that it's not so much about the formal knowledge that the universities yeah, teach, yeah. right? But the learning by doing, that's the title of the book, the learning by doing, which is like, this is all sort of sticky knowledge that you acquire by participating in tasks. And that is highly uncertain until it, it gels. So maybe you want to... Yeah, that's, that's. I think what, that was the. Yeah, I think that's what I got. Yeah. yeah. So, so. Uh, th yes, th there is this. Um, th there is a hierarchy in terms of education, um, and it, perhaps in some ways, I, I, I write about this a bit in the book that 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 uh, inequality is actually getting worse in some ways. I mean, you're seeing, if you look at government funding, it tends to go to four-year research universities, and while uh, funding going to community colleges has basically been stagnant. Um, so it's a, there's, there's, there's great inequality, and people write about how um, there's educational inequality. Uh, so I, I think that's an issue, but you know, as, as Kareem was pointing out, a lot of what we have to think about with technology isn't education per se. So there's this interesting uh, interplay between education and technical knowledge. Um, in the early mills, they, they, they recruited uh, literate. You, you, you had to be literate. You had to be able to read to, to, to work in the mills. Now, it's not because you needed to read to operate the loom. 
it's because if they hired literate mill girls, uh, it turns out that the literate ones were more productive. They were better at learning uh, in some general sense, so they could learn this, this new technology and acquire a different set of skills. So the, you know, the, as a new technology comes along, initially there's a greater demand for educated workers, even if their education isn't necessarily required for performing the job. As, uh, as technologies have matured, and this was true in textiles, and it was, it's, it's, there's some research showing it's true more generally, uh, the education requirements often go down. Um, and it's, it's as, it, as the institutions develop to, provide, to learn on the job, to provide vocational training, technical training, to people who have less formal schooling, um, we're providing a, a, you know, a way to develop knowledge more broadly. And I think that's, that's sort of the nut of, of, of the issue. We tend to focus, when we talk about skills and education, we, we tend to, when we talk, to, talk about skills and knowledge these days, we tend to focus on education. But a, part, a central part of my argument is it's much broader than just education. Yeah, and if I may add, I mean, Formal I've, I've, been, I've been engaging in this Twitter debate, <laughs> if you can have a debate on Twitter, uh, about this question. So, uh, you know, certainly in Silicon Valley, there's a view that, you know, formal schooling is not useful for the skills needed to succeed in the data, the technology revolution that we're now living in. And I think it's a fascinating, quite, we, we face this at the business school, like should our, should our MBA students learn how to code? Right? We don't hire computer scientists. Am I going to teach them you know, Fortran and Pascal or you know, C++? Probably not. There's no, but, but those skills are needed. right? So do you go outside and do you hire somebody else to come in and teach that? There's an explosion in sort of the code academy, online learning types of things as well that are, that are trying to address this gap between you know, learning how to think about the basics of programming languages that a CS major would get versus actually being able to program and create an application. But I think the interesting thing is that the, these skills, again, what's, what seems to me to be slightly different this time around is that the change required is so widespread. So just as law graduates will need to have a program, so will the business graduates, and so will biologists, and so will chemists, and so on. So there's a, almost a general purpose technology aspect to exactly, this. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and that the, that the formal, our institutions aren't yet capable enough to deal with providing those, th those skills in a formal way. So then we have to go outside the institution or rely on people to just learn, learn it themselves to be able to pull that off. Yeah, that, and that, that's, you hit on a key point, which is things are more difficult now because so many areas of technology and of industry are being affected at once. Whereas, yeah. you know, you think about weaving as part of manufacturing, which back then was only 20% of the economy. You know, and here we're talking about information technology affecting all industries. Pretty much. All industries, maybe 70% of industries yeah. intensively. Yeah. Your name, sir, and? Uh, my name is Benjamin Melanson. I am a, a web developer. <laughs> um, and it uh, is an exciting industry for a lot of us in it because, uh, in large part, because you have people who may have had education, but it's in other things. You know, the, yeah, the universe is still haven't caught up even with, with web development, which, yeah, changes all the time. But compared to other areas of information technology, it's at least been around a little while. Um, I guess i just go for the real big question. It's, you know, we, we have the productive capabilities in, um, in the world and have for quite a while to provide for what everybody needs. We've not been distributing it well, and we've done even worse giving people sort of the, the, the even greater resources and control over their lives that would allow people to really invest in learning new skills, to invest in setting their kids up for, you know, doing some really exciting things, and it's because you mostly don't have much of a, a safety net. Um, so it just... I mean, I don't know quite where I'm exactly what I want to ask with that. It's just that... Um, you know, this, this isn't new, but it, it may become more blindingly obvious to people that, um, you know, the, the problem isn't the technology, the problem is sort of the distribution of control over resources. Um, because, you know, you can all learn to code, but not going to make sense. Like, it's not like 
I almost feel like that the, the wages at the top of industries aren't high enough. Like if it were obvious that if you're at the top of the industry, if, if you just go out and learn for yourself um, and become you know, on top of your game, that you're gonna have a huge, um, you know, if you're, you're gonna be set for life, like people would find their way there. Um, and so it's sort of, it's like the old thing, like, you know, people say, oh, no one um, will do this job. But still, no one will do a job at the price that people are willing to pay for it. So I, I guess it's sort of, do we have to look at what prices, you know, the market is willing to bear for certain types of work and why that is? And I guess that goes back to what resources people have. If, you know, there would be huge industries for the training of people, and there are, but they'd be even bigger and better if the people who needed the training had the resources to pay for training. Um, and, you know, it, I don't know just, just the whole point that, like, we have a huge economy, a huge amount of economic activity, um, but, you know, what is, what is that working towards? And right now, with extreme inequality and the inequality we've generally always had, you're ultimately working towards making richer people richer. And, you know, just how that plays out through all of these um, you know, yeah, just where technology goes, where the technology moves to, and if there's anything from the frame of reference of this um, discussion that would inform um, sort of how we try to structure our, you know, our own um, advancement as, as workers in, in any industry. So, uh, I mean, I, 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 I picked one thing there, which is, so, so you know, my, my argument is, you know, we, we, we faced this, this extreme growing inequality in the early 19th, the first half of the 19th century, and developing the, you know, a widespread, a large number of people who had skills that could, could command good pay was the key towards making things more equal and more equitable. Um, and so I am guessing that a similar challenge faces us today, which leads me to disagree with you on the point that it's not just what the 90th percentile, the, the 90th percentile might be a, you know, a sign or a symbol, but um, you know, knowing that people can go out to Silicon Valley and become billionaires uh, in, sometimes in a f just a few years doesn't necessarily help the average person. <laughs> You know, who wants to be able to acquire a skill that can command a good wage, uh, and, and and so it, it's there to some extent two different two different problems. And you see, I mean, one of the reasons you see such extreme differences is because we don't have a way of uh, uh, we're we're not doing well at at uh, lifting up the middle. Jim, Jim, you had some specific policy recommendations yeah. on this. So maybe just go through that, just to sort of, not in detail, but the, there's like four or five categories of policy that you think could potentially, you know, help towards this, right. both reducing right. this inequality, but also potentially shrinking the time needed for this adjust. Uh, for that's, this adjustment. Yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's good. Let me see if I can hit on the main thing. So, uh, so I guess I've mentioned a, mentioned a couple ideas, but, but you know, to the extent that uh, things are becoming standardized, uh, having vocational training, having you know supporting the community colleges, work study programs, apprenticeship programs, those sorts of policies I think are very helpful, both whether they're done by corporate or government. Um, the employee mobility is very important. Um, so we we're, we've taken some steps in the wrong direction uh, regarding employee mobility in terms of. Much more extensive use of employee non-compete agreements, uh, broadening of trade secrecy protections, so that at least in some in some states, it uh, makes it difficult for technical people to switch jobs. Um, standardization and certifications, and that tends to happen mostly, at, I think, in an industry level. But to the extent that government can, hey, well, government does play a, play an important role. Government procurement. Uh, plays an important role. So in the past, uh, government procurement has played a critical role in advancing urge, early stage technologies and things like computers and semiconductors, wireless communications, but also in the 19th century, mechanical skills, uh, what's, what's called interchangeable parts. Um, 
one of the ways it did that was by making sure that open standards were used, that there was a knowledge exchange between people, that there were diverse players so that you had a lot of startups involved. Um, increasingly, government procurement has tended to favor politically influential large companies. You think about defense procurement, uh, particularly under, under Rumsfeld when there were also security concerns. You know, there was a clampdown on uh, graduate stu foreign graduate students and uh, the, the uh, research projects were directed towards large defense contractors rather than startups. And you know, you're seeing a move away uh, from supporting startups. Uh, in other areas, uh, other thing, you know, you, you, you see the decline in employee mobility, you see the decline in startups. I think there are a, a number of complex factors going on in, in, uh, with both of those, but there's some things that, we, you know, some research is pointing to, to, to changes. So there is research showing that um, non-compete agreements have an effect on employee mobility and innovation in startups. There is research showing that uh, software patent litigation has an effect on uh, startups and venture capital funding. Um, right. Those are a few things. <laughs> Hasid? Hi, Hasid Shah, Berkman Center. Um, what you've talked about is very specific, what sounds very specific to the United States, or at least to kind of developed Western economies. Um, to what extent do you think it applies to uh, the developing world? A good question, and I probably should say I don't know. <laughs> um, so, developing world has well. I, 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 I talk about the developing world, and I talk about sort of the middle income world. Um, a, a lot of the problems faced in, in economic development and in, in, in among the poorest countries are problems of transferring existing technology. Um, uh, and getting up to speed on that. So, now that involves some of the same issues about skills, but in some ways it's easier because that technology is more standardized. Um, so, I mean, we see that pattern happening. Uh, it's, it's striking how uh, some of the same techniques, the same organizational tools, the same approaches in terms of training labor that were used in Lowell, Massachusetts, were later used in the US South, and were later used in Japan, and have more recently been used in China in getting their textile industries started up. Um, uh, it, to the extent of having mill girls in dormitories. Um, right, if you look at Shenzhen right now, very much looked like, in China, very much looked like Lowell, Massachusetts. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, you, just, you, you, see, you see the same, I mean, to, to some extent, there's conscious imitation. Yes. You know, to, to some extent, um, which, I, which I think is, is probably generally a good thing. Um, but, you know, the, 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 those examples show that it, that, that can work. Uh, it's, not, it's not the only issue. I mean, the, the, I mean, the problem with developing nations is that they have a lot of problems to solve all at once. And, and so the, develop, developing that knowledge and that, and that skill um, you know, is a difficult problem, and it's and it's part of the you know it, it's it's part of the solution. Um, it's uh, I can give another illustration, which is by 1910, the same textile equipment that was used in U.S. and England was being shipped around the world. It was in India, it was in Japan, it was in Russia, uh, but the productivity of English and U.S. workers was six times the productivity of uh, workers in the, on the same equipment, in, in some cases even with English mill managers. Um, and it's because of the, diffi you know, the, the difficulty of transferring the skills and acquiring those skills. That said, there becomes sort of a second level problem. Once, once nations have gotten to, you know, the people talk about the, the, the what is it, the middle income ga uh, gap, um, you know, where, where they, a, a nation can acquire uh, the new, technology, the new technologies, develop the basic skills, but then has difficulty moving on uh, to a sort of the, the, the frontier of cutting edge technologies. Um, in the book I write about this question of why doesn't Japan have a vibrant software industry? 
J Japan had, it, you know, it was the second to the U.S. in terms of a co its computer industry. Uh, but it's, its computer industry is now beginning to suffer because it's got a very weak um, software industry. And the difficulties the software industry faces, to some extent, stem from the, the trade-offs that Japan had to make in, in terms of getting up to, getting to become uh, top level in, in computing. So you have uh, very dominant computer companies. You have very little in the way of independent software companies in Japan. You don't have a great deal of employee mobility. Uh, and so it becomes very difficult for startups to hire people in Japan in, in, in software. Um, so there's a, there's a whole other set, set of problems. Um, so the, the general question, the specific issues I talk about and the policy issues um, are, are really US centric. Uh, I think sort of the general problem of how do we develop broad based technical knowledge is common and it, it, it has its own particular uh, features in, in a developing environment. We have time for one more question. Yes, please. I, I'm a law professor at Suffolk. Um, uh, so I, I was so intrigued by the Lowell Mills beginning because growing up here, the Lowell Mills have a whole, I mean, they're a myth onto themselves. And you know, there's, there's a story about feminism, there's a story about um, women in work at a time when that was, I mean, there, you can tell lots of different stories about the Lowell Mills. Um, and so and that got me thinking about um, the role of the company in communities, that is, the, the role of the Lowell Mills in this community was was diverse, and um, and it seems to me that there's another story. Oh, I'm asking, is there another story one could tell about the difference in wages or the the stagnancy in wages now, um, as compared to previous shifts that has to do with the change of the role of the company in our communities. That is what we think the comp what role we think the company does or should play in our society. And so that's that's a more of like a sociological question, but it's also the question of the value that the that we think the company brings. And if if our dialogue has shifted to a more sort of efficiency economic or law and economic model about what we think these different actors in our society play, the role of the company maybe has changed and it's job is not to train, its job is not to um, you know, ennoble or anything like that. And so I'm just wondering if there is, there's a, there may be other ways of explaining why the wages have been stagnant in terms of, or, or in terms of what we think companies are supposed to do, what, it, what a successful company is, in fact. Good question. First off, I, I should, an important caveat I should say is I, I don't think the issues I'm talking about, or I don't think technology, is the entire question of stagnant wages. There are a lot of factors involved. So uh, um, I, I may fall into. Um, so this, this, is, this is a good question. First, I want to be careful that we don't romanticize the, the mill owners in Lowell, because <laughs> they were some tough, uh, tough bastards at times, too. So you know, they, they, they squashed strikes starting from 1836. Um, they, um, they reduced wages, I, I, they were a combine, I mean, they, you know, they, they had very definite interests and, and wages were stagnant because they wanted them to be stagnant. No, no different from the Silicon Valley, you know, wage fixing lawsuits, right? I mean, right, the right, Apple, right. Google, everybody was colluding right, to, right. to. So, so the Silicon so, Valley companies may want to attract, you know, may offer yeah. amenities to attract talented people, but at the same time, uh, they're, they're looking out for their bottom line as, as well. Um, you can look, well, so the, there may be an issue in terms of short-term outlook. I mean, so there, there, there's, there is a question, so people like Peter Capelli uh, uh, you know, raise this issue. Employers are whining about uh, lack of skills. Why don't they just invest more in training? And, and if you look at, in, in terms of what companies spend on formal training, uh, it's, been, it's declined over the last 20 years. Um, formal, that may not be a good statistic, and formal training is, I think, maybe not necessarily the kind of training that matters so much with new technology. A lot of it's learned on the job, uh, much more significant investments learned on the job. Um, 
uh, but I, yeah, I, 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 I think there probably is a real element of uh, short-term outlook by company, you know, uh, you know not, not wanting to feel that they need to make long-term investments in skills development. You, you see that in some industries and you see different patterns in other industries. Yeah, and I think, if I can just add something else, I mean, I think that there's certainly these concerns about financialization and how our capital markets are causing the, the short-term thing. But, you know, my sense, again, on the earlier comment, that the, 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 the current digital revolution that we're sort of seeing, so many industries get impacted, you know, 70% of the industries uh, are becoming really software industries. If you sort of think about an airline merger, an airline is as much a software company as it is if, as it flies planes to your hospital. That, that I think the, the, the demand for skills and the demand for the workers is going off the roof, right? And so right now we see the medical school competing with Facebook and with Google for the same data scientist. And so the question will become is how will the work, and that's like, this is one example, right? It's Pfizer does the same thing. And the question becomes how will the, will market forces, you know, at least help alleviate that by either raising more wages or making more investments in those types of things. But I think the tension is never going to go away, right? The tension that you know the jobs of the world will want to suppress wages, right, and and will want to limit curtail mobility, right, and what push for non-competes versus what's good for the general social welfare. And I think that that tension is not going to go away. I think we're going to be in this dynamic environment going forward. So we're almost out of time. I just want to, again, um, urge you to read the book. Uh, I learned a ton, uh, both in conceptually, how to think about what's going on in the economy, uh, but then there's great history and current examples uh, in terms of how we think about innovation, how we think about the relationship between knowledge and skills, um, and, the, and, the, and the long journey from uh, invention to implementation that uh, Jim uh, lays out so well uh, in the book. And just want to thank Jim for the work he did in the book and uh, for being here. Thank you. And the, the co-op, yeah. yeah.